Welcome to Tea Time with Chris, a podcast that celebrates faith, humor, and the power of storytelling. I'm Chris Tomlinson, your host, and I'm thrilled to invite you to join me for engaging conversations with people from all walks of life. Together, we'll sip some tea or whatever you prefer and explore life's joys and challenges with a focus on hope, inspiration, and positivity. I'll also share some of my personal stories and some poetry to add a touch of intimacy and creativity to our chats. So join me as we spread love, joy, and laughter with each episode. Welcome to Tea Time with Chris. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 8 of Tea Time with Chris. As usual, I'm your host, Chris Tomlinson. Today's topic is a favorite of mine. I wasn't sure what I was going to do for this episode. I didn't want to do just another episode and it's about me again. I know we're getting to know me better, but like I've said before, I want this podcast to be more. Anywho, before we jump into today's topic, let's get to the tea flavor of the week. This week's tea flavor, I'm pretty sure most people have heard of, jasmine. It originates from China, typically made by combining gray tea leaves with jasmine blossoms, allowing the tea leaves to absorb the floral aroma. It has a delicate and soothing taste with a subtly sweet and floral flavor. It is known for its calming and relaxing properties and is often enjoyed for its aroma and refreshing taste. It's also believed to have antioxidant properties and potential benefits for digestion, immune system support, and stress reduction. Ah yes, good stuff. I like this tea flavor and I've had it many times. So, without further ado, today we're venturing away from the tea cafe corner and we're going on a trip. Do you like to travel? I do. Of course, packing and such can be stressful, but I love to travel. I could go anywhere. But my kids, however, they don't like to go on long travels. Hopefully, you don't mind long travels because today we're traveling pretty far. Oh, and make sure to grab a suit on your way out. No, 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 not that kind of suit. A space suit. We're traveling light years today. The mile and such won't work on this travel. It's too far and wide. So strap on your helmets, buckle your safety belts, strap in, and we're off. Our first stop on our trip is our beautiful solar system. We're familiar with this neighborhood, right? We have our lovely home, Earth. Its surface is unlike any other in this area of space. From above, you see no borders, lines, no state names, no flags, just the layout of the Earth. You can see the edges, the lines that curve and form land masses. Clouds hover, floating while scattering around the entire planet. Water. So much water that fills our globe. Above, you'll see something strange. Lights flashing and flowing almost hauntingly above our planet. The Aurora Borealis. A beautiful and eerie scene all in one. In the center of our solar system is a powerful star we call the Sun. It is a nearly perfect ball of hot plasma, heated to incandescence by nuclear fusion reactions in its very core. The sun radiates its energy mainly as light, ultraviolet, and infrared radiation and is the most important source of energy for life on Earth. Every second, the sun's core fuses about 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium and in the process converts 
4 million tons of matter into energy. It takes 8 minutes for that light and heat to reach the Earth. Remember those strange lights we saw before above Earth? You're seeing that energy from the sun hitting against our planet's own shield system. Yes, our planet has its own shield. In fact, our own planet creates it itself. Deep inside the core of our planet is a liquid iron. As the Earth spins and orbits through space, this liquid iron is tossed around and spun so quickly, it causes a magnetic energy to form around the planet. This energy becomes our shield from all the dangers of the sun. As the sun's energy beats upon our planet, layers of our magnetic shield is pushed and dangerous radiation bounces off our shield and back into space. Without the shield, we would not even exist. Nothing would on this planet. No trees, no flowers, no animals. Water wouldn't even exist, or even humans. How amazing is it that the creator of this vast and ginormous space included and remembered every detail to implement into his creation to help protect and its drive. That's not just the only cool thing about a planet. There's a lot more I could talk about, but we have to go explore. We have lots to see. There's Mars, Mercury, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, Venus, and of course, little old Pluto. Each one of these planets are truly remarkable. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, it is a gas giant with a mass more than two and a half times that of all the other planets in the solar system combined, and slightly less than one thousandth the mass of the sun. Jupiter's surface is under a constant storm. The most obvious is the green red is the great red spot a giant storm which has been observed since 1831 and possibly even earlier and still goes on today jupiter has 95 known moons one of which europa has intrigued many scientists and observers slightly smaller than earth's moon europa is primarily made of silicate rock and has a water ice crust and probably an iron nickel core it has a very thin atmosphere, composed primarily of oxygen. Europa has the smoothest surface of any known solid object in our solar system. The apparent use and smoothness of the surface have led to the hypothesis that a water ocean exists beneath the surface, which could harbor life. There's Saturn, the second largest planet in our neighborhood. It is a gas giant with an average radius of about nine and a half times that of Earth. It is 95 times bigger than Earth. Saturn has a pale yellow hue due to ammonia crystals in its upper atmosphere. An electrical current within the metallic hydrogen layer is thought to give rise to Saturn's planetary magnetic field, which is weaker than Earth, but because of the massive size of Saturn, it has a 580, 580 times magnetic moment that covers the entire planet. The, out, the outer atmosphere is generally bland and lacking in contrast, although long-lived features can appear. Wind speeds on Saturn can reach 1,800 kilometers per hour or 1,100 miles per hour. The planet has a prominent ring system which is composed mainly of ice particles with a smaller amount of rocky debris and dust. There's at least 146 moons known to orbit the planet, and only 63 of those are officially named. Titan, Saturn's largest moon and the second largest in the entire solar system, is larger than the planet Mercury and is the only moon in the solar system to have a substantial atmosphere, which has also captured the attention of scientists and such. For possible life as well. It is the only moon known to have a dense atmosphere and is the only known object in space other than Earth on which clear evidence of stable bodies of surface liquid has been found. Titan's atmosphere is largely nitrogen. Minor components lead to liquid has been found. The atmosphere filled with the methane and ethane clouds 
The climate includes wind and rain and creates surface features similar to those on Earth, such as dunes, rivers, lakes, seas, which are probably of liquid methane and ethane, and is dominated by seasonal weather patterns such as on Earth. With its liquids, both, sub both surface and subsurface, and robust nitrogen atmosphere, Titan's methane cycle bears a strikingly similar to Earth's water cycle, although the temperature is much lower. It's about negative 179 degrees Celsius or negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, don't go swimming in there. Also, did you know it rains diamonds on Saturn? Thunder, lightning, and storms give rise to a natural phenomenon on Saturn that makes it rain diamonds. Roughly 1,000 tons of diamonds rain down every year on the planet. With carbon being abundant in this gas giant, lightning storm turn methane into soot, which, as it falls, it hardens into chunks of graphite and then rare diamonds. These diamond hailstones eventually melt into a liquid sea in the planet's hot cores. Measuring roughly a centimeter in size, these diamonds are so glorious, even the most glamorous celebrities would have wanted a piece of this. And how many diamonds are being created on Saturn? Roughly 1,000 tons, like I said before, a diamond a year. The Akol mine in Russia, known to be the biggest natural mine in the world, is estimated to have 175.56 million carats of diamonds. In fact, Saturn's not the only planet that rains diamonds. Jupiter, as well. Jupiter has a lot of similarities in terms of diamonds hailing down, as well as other mysterious weather phenomenons of different metals raining down. We have Mars, which is a big deal in space news lately. Mars is the first planet to be inhabited by robots. No, really. So far, we found no signs of life, but on Mars, there's about three active robots, but 11 have been sent overall. In fact, Mars is the first planet other than Earth to have a flying drone. Now, you might think, cool, we have those here on Earth, but Mars gravity is 38% less than Earth. So you can't just send a regular drone to Mars. If you were to do that, the thing would spin out of control and wouldn't function correctly at all. Instead, they had to redo the, dr redo the drone to adapt to Mars gravity and winds. They weren't even 100% sure that the drone would even work because it's very hard to test things with different gravity, but it can be done. This one drone, though, was the first of its kind, and it worked on the first try, and it's still going longer than was anticipated. The reddish color of its surface is due to finely grained iron oxide dust in the soil, giving it the nickname the Red Planet. Mars has a very thin atmosphere made primarily of carbon dioxide and two irregularly shaped natural satellites or moons, Phobos and Di Di Deimos, Deimos, however you say it. Then there's Mercury, which is probably the most driest and deadest of the planets in our system. It is a terrestrial planet with a heavily cratered surface due to the planet having no geological activity at all. Despite being the smallest planet in the solar system, 38% of that of Earth, Mercury is dense enough to have roughly the same surface gravity as Mars. Mercury also has a dynamic magnetic field, but its strength is about 1% of that of Earth and has no natural moons. Having almost no atmosphere to retain heat, Mercury has surface temperatures that change wildly during the day, ranging from negative 173 degrees Celsius or negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit, it goes to 427 degrees Celsius, 800 degrees Fahrenheit during sunlight across the equator regions. Due to Mercury's slow rotation, an observer on the planet would see only one Mercurian day, which is equivalent to 176 days on Earth. Mercury is the most difficult planet to reach from Earth because it requires the greatest change in spacecraft's velocity. Only two spacecrafts have visited Mercury as of this year, 2023. Mariner 10 flew by in 1974 and 1975, and Messenger launched in 2004 orbited Mercury over 4,000 times in four years. And there's a planned spacecraft to planet Mercury in 2025. Then we have Venus. It's a rocky planet with a mass the size nearly second in the solar system to Earth. And with an, and with an atmosphere, which is the thickest of all four rocky planets of the solar system, 
and substantially thicker than Earth's. Venus retains, despite having only a weak induced magnetosphere, an especially thick atmosphere of mainly carbon dioxide, creating an extreme greenhouse effect together with its global sulfuric acid cloud cover, which means it rains acid rain. Because of this, the atmosphere reaches at its bottom temperature of around 460 degrees Celsius or 860 degrees Fahrenheit and has a crushing pressure of 92 times that of Earth's sea level, turning the air into a supercritical fluid, though at a cloud atmosphere that's similar to Earth's. Internally, Venus is thought to consist of a core mantle and crust, the latter releasing internal heat through its active volcanoes shaping the surface with large research instead of plate tectonics. So like how on our planet Earth, the land mass is shaped and formed by plate tectonics pushing up against each other and forming mountains and different land masses and stuff. Whereas on Venus, there is no plates pushing. Instead, it's heat and pressure and active vol volcanoes shape the surface. Venus has no moon and it rotates slower than its orbit. It has a solar year of 224 Point seven Earth days. So it actually is shorter than one Earth year. Venus and Earth approach each other every 1.6 years while coming close to each other than any other pair of planets in our solar system. That said, the gravitational potential between Earth and Venus from Earth, this is approximately allows Earth and Venus to be more accessible to each other, which causes us to use it as like a gravitational slingshot, if you will. So basically what it means is when Venus and Earth come to that close point every 1.6 times, we're able to send a spacecraft to Venus and orbit it. And because of the gravity of Earth and Venus so close, it actually will pull said spacecraft and push it further out like a slingshot. So which we can use to send things out further into space by just using the gravity of it, you know? Then we have Uranus. Yes. It's pronounced that way and not the way you think. Uranus is the seventh planet from the sun and is a gaseous cyan ice giant. Most of Uranus is made of water, ammonia, and methane in a supercritical phase of matter, which in astronomy is also called ice. The planet's atmosphere has a complex layer, cloud structure, and has the lowest minimum temperature out of all the solar system planets, which can go to negative 224 degrees Celsius or negative 371 degrees Fahrenheit. Uranus takes 84 years of Earth years to orbit around the sun. Its poles get around 42 years of continuous sunlight followed by 42 years of continuous dark. There are many unexplained climate phenomena in Uranus's atmosphere, such as its peak wind speed of 560 miles per hour, variations in its polar cap, and its erratic cloud formation. Like the other giant planets, Uranus has a ring system orbiting natural satellites and a magnet and a magnetosphere. Uranus's ring system is extremely dark, which is only about 2% of the incoming light is reflected, so it's very hard to see. And it contains 13 known moons. As of this year, Uranus has only been visited once. 1986 by the Voyager 2 probe. Now we have Neptune. It's the eighth planet from the sun and is the fourth largest planet in the solar system by diameter and the third most massive planet in the densest giant planet. It is 17 times the mass of Earth and is slightly more massive than its near twin Uranus. The planet orbits the sun once every 164.8 years. Neptune is not visible to the unaided eye and it is the only planet in the solar system found by mathematical prediction rather than by, by being observed. It was observed finally on a telescope on September 23rd in 1846. Its distance from Earth makes it very small apparent size and it makes it challenging to study with Earth-based telescope. Like the gas giant Jupiter and Saturn, Neptune atmosphere is composed primarily of hydrogen and helium, along with traces of hydrocarbons and possibly nitrogen, but contains a higher proportion of ices such as water, ammonia, and methane. Its interior is primarily composed of ice and rock. It has weather patterns driven by the strongest sustained winds of any planet in the solar system, with record wind speeds as high as 1,300 miles per hour. And because of its great distance from the sun, Neptune's outer atmosphere is one of the coldest places in the solar system, with temperature at its cloud tops approaching negative 361 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 218 degrees Celsius. Temperatures at the planet's centers is approximately 5,100 degrees Celsius or 9,300 degrees 
Fahrenheit. Then here's Pluto. Pluto is a dwarf planet. It's the ninth largest and 10th most massive known object to directly orbit the sun. Pluto is made primarily of ice and rock and is much smaller than the inner planets. Pluto has only one sixth the mass of Earth's moon and one third of its volume. Light from the sun takes five and a half hours to reach Pluto. Remember, it only takes eight minutes to reach Earth. So it takes five and a half hours to reach Pluto. Pluto's surface is composed of more than 98% nitrogen ice with traces of methane and carbon monoxide. The New Horizons mission was the first spacecraft to visit Pluto and its moons, making a flyby on July 14, 2015 and taking detailed measurements and observations. One of the most famous pictures taken of Pluto shows the surface to contain a heart-shaped formation called Sputnik Planitia. The western lobe of the heart is a 1,000 kilometer wide basin of frozen nitrogen and carbon monoxide ices. In 2006, the International Astro Astronomical Union formally redefined the term planet to exclude dwarf planets such as Pluto. But most people, however, continue to consider Pluto and other dwarf planets to be counted among planets. What an amazing neighborhood we have here in our tiny part of the Milky Way galaxy. We all know about the Earth orbiting the sun and so forth, but did you know we're not just sitting here going around the sun? No. Did you know we're traveling through space as we orbit the sun? In fact, our entire neighborhood isn't just sitting floating in space. We're traveling through space constantly, never sitting. So as all our planets orbit the sun, we're also traveling together through space at 200 kilometers per second or at an average speed of 448,000 miles per hour. Imagine this, you're in a car and outside your car, a tiny little planet floating around it, but they're traveling along with you on the road. You're going straight on this road at 80 miles per hour and yet these plan tiny planets are still orbiting around your car. As you drive to grandma's or to the store to pick up some more tea, those planets are right there with you, zooming at 80 miles per hour down the road. That's how we're traveling with the rest of the planets in our sun. I think it's amazing. Growing up, I didn't know space was constantly expanding outward. I thought we were just sitting here floating. All right, so we know of our little neck of the galactic woods. You want to see some things that truly blow your mind? How well do you think you know the mind of God? Honestly, I myself can say I don't know or can even comprehend the mind of God. We tend to put God in a box and we say and believe certain things, but that's it though. God stays in this box and nothing strange or unexplainable ever happens. God does this and that's it. I believe God can do literally anything at all he wants. I believe he still creates to this day new and wondrous things we could never imagine. Let me show you a few examples. We're going to leave our solar system now. No one has ever left our solar system except for one device, Voyager 1, launched on September 5th, 1977, is the only known device humanly created to leave our solar system. It is and has been traveling for 45 years, 8 months, and 26 days as of today, May 31st, 2023. At a distance of 14.799 billion miles, 23.816 billion kilometers from Earth. We're going to go further than that, though. A lot further. We're going to go 40.12 light years away to a planet called 55 Cancri. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it's at just twice the size of Earth, but it has eight times the mass of Earth. The reason? It's allegedly made mostly of precious diamonds. Zooming around its star in just 18 hours. Its surface has a temperature of nearly 2,700 degrees Celsius or 4,892 degrees Fahrenheit. According to NASA, the value of this planet has been theorized to be around a whopping 26.9 no, no million or no million, no million, how do you say it? Compared to it, the world's bank system is an estimate on Earth to be only at 70 trillion. That's just 70 trillion. This planet is 26.9 nanillion. I've never even heard of that number. A planet made of diamonds. That's not all though. There are even more amazing things out here. Come on. Over here, at about 855 light years away from our solar system, is a planet called WASP-121b. It was discovered in 2015. It's nearly twice as big as Jupiter, and the planet is tidally locked to its star, which means one side of it always faces its star, and the other side never faces it, and it zooms around space in a blistering 30-hour orbit. WASP-121b upper atmosphere can reach temperatures up to 3,000 degrees Celsius, or 5,432 degrees Fahrenheit on the day side, the side that, you know, faces the sun constantly, which makes the water molecules glow and even break down. On the night side, 
the side that never faces the sun, temperatures drop to 1500 degrees Celsius or 2732 degrees Fahrenheit. And this gives rise to incredibly strong winds that move those glowing broken water molecules to the cooler side of the planet. Now, because of that, the water vapor isn't allowed to form clouds long enough or big enough to rain. So the atmosphere is filled with metals, specifically iron, magnesium, chromium, and vanadium. And those metals can condense into clouds on the night side and cause a rain of liquid gems like rubies and sapphire. Can you imagine that? It's not raining water. It's literally raining rubies and sapphires. Then there's a planet called HD 189733b, and it has a bright blue marble appearance, which NASA says is generated from the planet's hazy blowtorch atmosphere containing clouds laced with glass that rains sideways when combined with the ferocious, ferocious winds that blow up to 5,400 miles per hour. And that rain is also super hot due to the close proximity between the planet and its sun. On the world's daytime temperature can soar up to as high as 1700 degrees Fahrenheit or 930 degrees Celsius, making the rain less like water and more like molten glass. 57 light years from Earth is a planet called GJ504b. It's a magenta colored planet. The planet is made of pink gas. It's similar to Jupiter, but GJ504b is four times more massive than Jupiter. At only 460 degrees Fahrenheit, it's the temperature of a hot oven, and it's the planet's intense heat that causes it to glow. There's so much more out there. When we look up at the stars on a clear night, it's easy to feel a sense of insignificance. The sheer scale of the cosmos is mind-boggling. Did you know that there are estimated to be over 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe? Each of these galaxies contains billions or even trillions of stars, and among them, countless planets. The numbers alone are staggering, but they only scratch the surface of the immensity that is space. Space is also a playground for cosmic phenomena that challenge our understanding of the universe. Take, for example, black holes. Cosmic entities with gravitational forces so strong that not even light can escape them. The very concept of black hole stretches the limits of our, of our imaginations and just beckons us to explore the mysteries that lie within. We don't even know what's beyond the horizon, the even horizon of a black hole. We don't know what's in there, but theorize that if something was to survive the immense pressure, the immense gravity, gravity that's in a black hole, because that's what a black hole is. It's just, it's a star that's collapsed on itself and it's continuously just collapsing and sucking in everything around it. And it's just, so much gravity that nothing, nothing can leave it. If a spacecraft was all of a sudden to get caught in the force of the gravitational field from a black hole, there's no way it can keep it. No matter what it does, it's, it's done. It's going in. And no one knows what's in there because we, we have nothing that can survive. But it's theorized that if something was to survive and someone was able to turn back and look back out the entrance of the black hole, you would see time play out in front of you from the very beginning of time to the very end of time. And also if someone was to look at you from a distance, you would literally look like you just stopped, like time just stopped for you and you're there permanently in that one position. But yet for you, time would still be going and your whole body, like your molecular structure, everything about you would be stretched and they call it spaghettification, which I think is hilarious. But you literally get stretched out like a noodle and you just continuously stretch and stretch and obviously you would probably die. But if somehow, some way you were able to survive this, they theorize that on the other side of a black hole, there's an exit to possibly another galaxy or another universe or something. We don't know. We just don't know. It's just fascinating, fascinating to me that there's such forces out there in space that's just so unexplainable, mind-blowingly strong, that it's just, it's terrifying, but yet at the same time, it's amazing. I think of Psalms 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. This verse reminds us that through the immensity and splendor of space, we witness the handiwork of a divine creator. The intricate patterns of galaxies, the delicate balance of planetary systems, and the intricate dance of celestial bodies all point to the majesty and intelligence 
behind it all. In Isaiah 40, 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. There's more stars out there than there are grains of sand here on Earth. There's been several Earth-like planets discovered as well. Some two times larger than Earth and some even a little smaller than Earth, but contain a rocky surface, have greenery, atmosphere, and so forth. Who knows what kind of life could be there? I personally believe there is life out there on other planets. Why would God stop at just what he made on Earth? Sure, humans are made in the image of God, but there's loads of life on Earth that isn't, and yet God created them. Why not on other planets? There could be a planet of a form of life we could never even imagine. One thought that actually depresses me is that space is so huge, so vast. The distance from us here on Earth is just too big. There's things out there that'll never ever be seen or touched by us. And that saddens me because there could be a life form so majestic and beautiful and I'll never see or know about it. There could be a life on a planet begging and calling out for help but they're so far away from any other planets that they never find any help and civilizations are completely wiped out, never to be known. I imagine planets full of plants and flowers and nature so vivid it almost seemed like an image from a fictional book. Scientists have discovered planets full of lava, full of water, full of just dead rocks or balls of gas and just so much more that we never could have imagined. God did, though. Some things on Earth point to life that can strive in atmosphere that we never thought otherwise. In the deepest parts of the ocean here on Earth, there's volcanic tubes that just shoot out intense heat. So hot, everything should literally dissolve or melt away. But what scientists have found instead, though, is life thriving around those volcanic tubes. A life form feeding off particles of the heat. There's even life in the absolute coldest parts on Earth, living and thriving in places that they should never exist. What's stopping similar forms of life to thrive on other planets that we think are not sustainable for life? Did you know there are suns out there so big it could fit literally hundreds of Earth-sized planets inside itself? Suns so big and massive that our own sun it literally looks invisible compared next to it. There's great formations of gases and clouds and forms of energy and light molecules, atoms throughout space that show off wondrous formations that would leave your jaw just dropped. Such beauty is out there in space, yet it's so dangerous and life-threatening to our own bodies, yet so amazing to imagine and witness. I get lost gazing into the night sky, imagining what all is out there. What is God showing off to us and telling us, inviting us to know him better? He's showing us how creative and imaginative he is. He doesn't have to. In fact, God could have just created our little solar system and then everything else just doesn't exist. But instead, he continues to create on a canvas and playground so massive that we can't even see or fathom what's beyond what we know. In fact, we have barely scratched the surface of what's out there. We only know about 5% of the universe and the remaining 95% is still a mystery. We can only see so far with the telescopes and yet we know there's much more out there. This theory is that what lies beyond would be so different and strange to us, like floating bubbles of different galaxies, or who knows what else is out there. Whatever it is, it fascinates me. It intrigues my mind that it pulls me in to want to know more and more. There's so much more I could talk about with space, but for now I'll have to stop here for the sake of time, but I will definitely do a part two or even part three, four, or whatever in the future of some more space-related news and things that I find intriguing and that just show me and teach me more and more about our creator and just it just shows how loved we are because if you think of how vast and huge spaces and what's out there and yet out of all that god chose humans to be an image of him and to love us and to give up his own son for us so that we can experience life with him and know what it's like and i know it's kind of weird and confusing and mysterious of what life will be like you know, in the end, like after all this. And, but I like to imagine that God allows us to explore and see all the creation that he has done and still does and will do. I can't wait to see it. I just, I want to see, I just want to see all of it because every time I, I, I read some other new article about space or some new thing discovered and I'm just like, wow, there's even more of the mind of God just shown to us and of what he can do and what he does. So hopefully you enjoyed today's episode of tea time with chris i know it wasn't like some big amazing story or inspirational message or whatever but i'm hoping i'm hoping it was interesting intriguing maybe and maybe uh, 
encourages you more to look more into space and how amazing and intriguing it can be and how interesting the mind of God is. So, Anyways, again, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Chris Tomlinson, your host. Continue to stay awesome, and God bless. <laughs>